This is the April meeting of the W3C WebRTC Working Group. We'll have two hours together today. The group abides by the W3C patent policy, shown at the link below, and only in people and companies listed as participants on the status page are allowed to make substantive contributions. So today we're going to cover uh, a number of topics, custom codex, captured surface switching, media capture main, and background segmentation. Uh, we have meetings once a month, and the next ones are May 21st, June 18th, and July 16th. We usually skip the month of August, and September is TPAC. So a little bit about the meeting. Uh, the slides are published in the wiki, and, and there's a link to them there. Uh, we're now recording the meeting, and the recording will be public. Do we have volunteers to take notes? I'll do it. Oh, thank you, Dom. This meeting operates on the W3 Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. Uh, we're all passionate about improving what we're see, but uh, let's keep it cordial and professional. So a few things about the meeting tips. You probably all know how to use Google Meet. But uh, we do run a speaker queue, so raise your hand to get into it and lower your hand uh, to get out of it. And please wait for microphone access. Uh, don't jump the queue and use headphones or an echo canceling speakerphone and state your full name so we can uh, put things accurately in the minutes. Just a little note about document status, just because something's in the repo doesn't imply it's been adopted. We have a formal adoption process uh, and also a process for working group consensus determination. All right. So here's the agenda. We've got Harold first, then Tobe, Yanivar, and Riju. And uh, I think we've got plenty of time today. Maybe we'll even finish early. Uh, but uh, please try to keep within the time limits. Thank you. All right, Harold, you have the floor. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I've been working on this PR since June of 2023 and have had iterations on uh, design of the API shape multiple of them. Janiva has been a great sparring partner for coming up with uh, alternatives. And uh, what's now in the draft is uh, definitely very close to something so, something that he suggested. So I, I suspect he would, should have joint honor on this one. Uh, next slide. We presented the shape before, so I'm just showing up a couple of slides from the from the the explainer that shows how to use it. You basically, when you set up a transform, you add input codecs and output codecs to the to the list of arguments. And uh, next slide. And a worker does its transform as usual. And in addition, it uh, sets uh, the MIME type of the result to the codec that they have agreed that this is the format we're actually sending or receiving. So the point of this exercise is to, is to actually speak truth to the, to the world about what we're, what we're doing. So if we have something that we don't want people to look inside, we should uh, package it as MIME type that tells people not to look inside. So I think the, the spec is finished. As usual, I probably made some stupid mistakes in IDL or markup or wherever, but uh, to me, it reads readable. So I'm going to ask the editors to merge it next on, on Thursday, or whether I can have editors can integrate when they have finished making comments on my mistakes. Next slide. We do have one outstanding item, because this doesn't work unless you can set the mind type of a, of a, uh, of a frame. So we, we can do it two, two ways. One is to use the frame copy constructor that we have merged. And the other one is to use set metadata. 
which has stalled, has no action since October. Um, both can be specified to change the mind type. Personally, I feel like uh, set metadata is the one that fits naturally with uh, the operation of uh, taking a frame, doing a transform, passing it on. The copying seems like uh, extra line noise. But uh, on the other hand, we do have the copy constructor. We have specified one way to do it. So we might want to optimize that one and not that too. So that's, that's my open issue. So the floor is open for discussion. I'll see if I can. Janivar. Uh, yeah, so so thank you, Harold. I'm supportive of the API shape. I think that looks very good. And uh, the on the question of constructor or set metadata, uh, it's a bit complicated, I guess, in that um, I think ideally uh, it's complicated because we have these uh, frames, encoded frames, are mutable, unlike web codecs. So in that sense, which is, I guess, a bit unfortunate, but it makes sense for the uh, use cases of uh, encryption, decryption, adding metadata, where JavaScript is basically offered to modify both the frame and then perhaps its metadata. Uh, had we gone more of the web codecs model, the web codecs model it has immutable frames, and by that model, we would emphasize uh, copy constructor. Um, but that would actually copy the data as well. And it's still not clear whether that's a cost that would happen somewhere in the pipeline anyway. It's not clear to me. Um, if, so if, it's if, unclear. If we, if we had immutable data, uh, we would. I think we would have. Uh, we we would have to have a copy constructor that took a separate argument for the data itself. Yeah. So that it's not copied from the incoming frame. So I don't have a clear answer on your question, but uh, I see others have hands up. So Bernard. Yeah, I'm also supportive of this, um, and I actually think set metadata is fine here because the concerns we had about uh, in web codecs, which caused us to, to make it immutable, I don't think exists here. Um, that is, uh, although I, I could be wrong, I, I didn't see anything that would allow you to try to change the metadata while some operation was in progress. Um, so I think set metadata is safe. Um, yeah, I welcome anybody who thinks there's some kind of race condition, but I, I don't. I don't see a reason why it would be unsafe. Uh, and the frame copy constructor, as, as was noted, it, I don't, well, it's nice to be able to do it without a copy. So I think that's a good thing to go ahead. I did have a weird little uh, question, though, about the codec. Um, you know, with, with some of the codecs like H.264, right, the definition of a codec is kind of weird. It's not just the MIME type. It's all of these other weird things, like the packetization mode and the profile. Um, and so you can you can set all that junk too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, so the mime type is uh, defined as the whole whole mime type, with including the parameters. Including the parameters, right? Okay. Yeah, I just I know it's going to be kind of ugly, but thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, it can be. So Tim Panton says that he's on the train, so he can't speak, but is supportive, supportive of this. So we have uh, two people, me and Bernard, who think that uh, set metadata might be worthwhile. And so with that, I think we, I think we have enough to, to say that we should pick up uh, PR two or two and see if we. If we can, can make it do the right thing. A question: uh, Wasn't there also some uh, support from Guido on the copy constructor for the encoded frame with the 
Uh, does it have some utility that's different in encoded R RTC, RTP encoded frames source or whatever we called it? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, the copy constructor we want it for the um, encoded source. Uh, but I I have no problem with also uh, having set metadata, which is a better fit for this use case. So. Okay. Well, we should um, maybe we should discuss it a little more on, on GitHub then, also yeah. to get Yuan's perspective. I don't see him here today. Um, and then pick uh, one or the other. Bernard. Yeah, I'm speaking on behalf of Tim Panton, who uh, in the chat says, uh, I'm, uh, is there any issue with daisy chaining this? I think daisy chain would be done, oh, Harold says, purely in JavaScript. And then uh, copy might be clearer than set metadata in a daisy chain. Ah, he says multiple, tra he means multiple transforms in sequence. So I guess you're, that makes sense to you, Harold? Yeah, so I think the pipeline step actually, uh, uh, if they're connected by pipelines, uh, I think the pipeline step actually makes a good barrier between transforms, so that uh, you hand it off from you have a definite handoff point from one to the next. Once you've handed it off, you can't modify it anymore. Right. So I, I think my vote is on the constructor in that case unless they're convincing arguments that there's a burdensome uh, cost. I guess I had a, a question on here. So in the daisy chain situation, so I put it through one transform, like I set the metadata and I output it and queue it, and then it goes into the next transform, right? And are we saying at that point you can't call set metadata anymore? I just wanted to be. Well, I think the issue with set metadata, uh, which the copy constructor would solve, uh, so with set metadata, you can end up with talk to issues. That's my quite That's my been my overall question. Is yeah, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, is well, that true or, true or not? Like I'm in well, I'm setting metadata before I call in queue, right? So well, let, let's for argument's sake that uh, I mean, all you have to do to use the transform API is to provide uh, a single pipe from the readable to the writable, right? So it's up to the JavaScript, however, how many uh, nodes and or streams objects in that pipe to add. So you can imagine a complicated application have mul having multiple steps and could confuse itself if it, multiple of those steps are using set metadata uh, on a uh, on a timer, for instance. You can end up. Ah, okay. Uh, th that's a risk inherent, of course, with modifiable data. But it questions whether we should continue that model uh, that we have for the data itself, also with the metadata. But it's all on it's all on a single thread. I mean, that was the problem with web codecs, right? Is you hand it to the encoder, that's running on another thread, right? That's why we couldn't we couldn't mm -hmm. allow you to modify it because you could get a race condition. I'm just trying to understand here if that if that's that's well, real possibility. But for that, there's a stopgap in the browser specifications on on the writable to the browser. When you're done with the frame and pass it back to the browser, we have a specific uh, transfer step to ensure a handoff of the, the bytes of the the graphics data. Yeah, but um, I don't know if we do that for the metadata. Uh, the, ch the chance step is uh, yes we do. Um, the chance step is the kind of isolator for, between the transform and the and the the browser. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just trying to think, Harold. I mean, you you call set metadata that that can't get executed like after in queue or something, right? It it has to be. Right, so it has to be within that transform, and after you call in queue, no no set metadata operation could be executed after that. So, yeah, I That's don't. Cool. I'm just trying to understand. It doesn't seem like a race could happen, but but yeah. what ensures that? So, uh, 
PR one, PR two or two. I mean, okay. if, if, if you want that sync, then I get it sync. Or... But uh, JavaScript could await, you know, a timer and modify it later. And what would happen in that case? Would it throw? Oh, if it's been dispatched, um, it's uh, no longer there. What's the call? It's detached. Because you call set metadata on the object, yeah, on okay. the frame, encoded frame object. If the object's been in okay. queue, yeah. for yeah. example, say it was in queued, you call it on the timer later, right? That object, right. it would be gone, right? It would, it would fail. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. No, you're right. That that could work. Uh, I was just trying to remember if metadata is a separate object, but it's not. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just worried that we'll end up with uh, merging both PRs, and that seems redundant. So maybe we could no, we already solve merged, it up. We already merged the copy construct. Yeah, that, it, I don't right. think it's redundant, though, right? Is it? Well, I mean, if, if you can copy the metadata into an, a new one, then you don't need set metadata unless there's a uh, uh, you know, significant well, cost uh, from the copy. We, we specify that the copy construct does does a deep copy. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm sure we can optimize that for a num in the implementation for a number of cases, but uh, at the moment, it specify as a copy. Mm -hmm. Copies are expensive. Pick your yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I, I think uh, I would suggest we discuss PR202 on GitHub when we have UN's comment as well, and I'm sure we can make progress there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the copy constructor works. Yeah. Set metadata. I, I think set metadata looks cleaner, but it's, it's, it's an optimization, not a blocker. So let's this let's. Uh, the, so it seems that we we have su full support for the shape of the API currently, and uh, and we have uh, an agreement to discuss in PR two hundred two. Sounds good to me. Next, error schedule. Yes. Hi. Uh, so my in... oh, where are we? <laughs> I think next slide. Next slide. Uh, or I'm seeing now the constructor set metadata. Are you seeing this also? Because I think we're on the wrong slide now. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we got in the notes everything Harold okay. said yes. according to the status. Uh, are you okay, Dom? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay, so we'll, we can move on now. Uh, thank you for your patience, Toby. All yeah, right. No Yes, so hi, uh, my name is Tove Peterson, and uh, I'm going to talk about capture surface switching today. And uh, this is a issue, even if it's uh, have a old name that is no longer the right one, but it's the right, right issue at least. Uh, next slide. So uh, surface switching, that, there are already some examples of this in, in uh, existing uh, user agents. So we have in Chrome that we can switch between uh, different tabs. And in Safari or Mac OS, you have also the option of switching between windows and uh, different screens. And we, so we are kind of working towards uh, trying to expand this to be able to switch between various different uh, surface switching, which will uh, require, or at least it would be good if we have some APIs to support for that uh, those kind of switching. Uh, yeah, next slide. And yes, to, as a recap here, uh, these are models we had discussed previously uh, for, for how to do this. So the injection model, that is what we are, is kind of what's used in the tab switching and, uh, and uh, yeah, the existing models for this. Uh, so when we switch, when the user is switching uh, between different tabs or different windows, uh, uh, the, the new uh, media that comes from these surfaces are injected directly into the existing tracks, which is done um, almost completely transparent for the application. Uh, and the other model we have been, the basic model we've been discussing is the switch track model, where, where um, yeah, each uh, yeah, each new capture surface gets, gets a new track or set of tracks, if it's audio also. And uh, so, so when we're switching, we get an event with the new tracks and, uh, and the application can then uh, rebind uh, 
what it is using these tracks for. And when, when this event has been processed, uh, the old tracks are stopped. So next slide, please. And here are some examples of this. Uh, in the injection model, there is uh, the only thing we have had, we, we need to add like an opt-in here because when we are starting to switch between different surfaces, uh, uh, some existing application might break because they kind of assume that this is constant. But otherwise, uh, there is nothing much for a patient doing in that model. For the switch track model, we have this event handler that the application needs to register uh, where it receives a new stream and can rebind that for whatever use it's using it for. And I would like to make an observation here that I, I, I personally feel that both of these uh, API ships are very like simple and straightforward. And I really, really would like to kind of that we could kind of reach something that looks something like this, that is kind of very easy, straightforward to use. And, and we should not make these things harder than this. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, when we're uh, thinking about what kind of model we want to use here, I, I would like to first say that from Google's perspective, like our preference is the switch track model. And uh, the reason for that is it's it's more predictable for that for applications, especially applications that are uh, uh, like uh, yeah interacting with specific surfaces. And and we also have uh, some developer feedback around this that that uh, actually all three developers I've talked to felt that yeah it's a bit like scary that things change under the feet and it's it's prefer it's more feels more predictable that we have like a track and we know that this track is for a specific surface. And um, and I also would like to note here that that the existing, we, I mean, we can let the existing functionality remain, so we will not kind of remove that uh, just because we are uh, uh, switching over to the switch track model. However, there have been some concerns with this using the switch track model only uh, that have been raised in the uh, yeah, in previous discussions and in the issue. Uh, some of them is that that it's kind of a, like uh, requiring the switch track model, it, it adds some extra work for for application that doesn't really care about what kind of surface we are uh, using, and that that injection model might be preferable. There's also been concern around like uh, some syncs that get gets interrupted if we switch out the track, for instance, media recorder, and uh, and there's also been some speculation around that applications might need to choose this model at the event time that we can't do this in advance and and that like and uh, so like a compromise proposal. Uh, 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 I, will, I would like to propose a model that is kind of an injection model and a switch track model in parallel, which I've named multi-track model, which will be described in the following slides. So if you go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. And uh, so in the multi-track model, we, we, we kind of differentiate between two different types of tracks. So we have surface tracks, uh, which, are connect we are, which are directly connected to a specific surface. It's, this is kind of trying to illustrate some tabs and windows here. And um, and this can have like a lifetime that's connected to the track, oh, sorry, the surface capture. And we can have like functionality that's specific for that surface. And, and the application can know that this track only covers the surface. And just like in switch track model, these are exchanged when, when we throw an event when, when, uh, when the, uh, the capture surface is changing. And then we have like a, a concept of a session track, which is like uh, uh, a track that li lives throughout the capture, the whole capture session. And it switches over from one capture surface to the next one. Uh, next slide, please. And here are some examples. Uh, it's kind of the same again, all again here, more or less. For the first one here, if we want to use the session tracks, which is similar to the action model, we just ask for that. We say that we want this, the, the session tracks, and then we get a stream that that uh, will be used throughout the session. And we don't really need to do anything more than just use it, for instance, connected to a video event. Uh, or in, alternatively, if you are more interested in specific surfaces, we can say that we want the surface tracks. And then we uh, uh, additionally also need to kind of supply this event handler through this uh, capture, capture controller. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. And you can also um, supply, you can also ask for both of these type of tracks at the same time. And uh, and uh, then you, you like before, you get the session stream from the get media call that, that you can, that using the action model, and you can bind that to one video element. At the same time, you can also uh, ask the surface uh, uh, tracks, and then th those tracks will be delivered through this event. 
And I, I want to note there also there is a small difference here from the, the switch track model that was, as it was described earlier, in that here we we um, uh, we, we have the event handler get uh, get these tracks for each surface, uh, and that is so that we can still return uh, use the return value for the session stream. Uh, but it, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And uh, yeah, so to just kind of go through what uh, yeah, some favorite properties of this model is that yeah, an application can then request the type of tracks it needs, uh, and uh, it can you choose one or the other or both. Uh, and they are generally they are quite straightforward to use, similar to the basic models, uh, depending on which one you choose. Uh, we still retain this direct mapping from one surface track to one surface, which is very uh, yeah, which makes things clearer when you are looking at specific surfaces we are sharing. And we still have provide the injection model uh, for those things that require it. And you can, you can have this choice between session tracks and surface tracks. There is some kind of uh, flexibility for the applications to to uh, to kind of, yeah, they can choose do these choices at event time and they can start with the session track. And if they, for some reason, want to change to a surface track, it can do that at the event time. Uh, it can also, um, use uh, uh sorry do the choice individually per track so if it's if it's like recording something over multiple surface switching from with me recorded you can use uh in the injection model for that while it's uh might use uh surface tracks for some other purposes and uh next slide please so that's where we're at the end here and i, I think that the, my, my kind of presentation here has been quite high level i, I it's more about like trying to trying to find like some kind of common ground, like a framework that we can have, like as, as, as for for like continued discussions here, and, and uh, so that is kind of what, what I'm interested in here. In here is if, if like if this looks like a promising way forward, and if there are concerns that still needs to be resolved, if if we uh, to kind of go this way, and uh, I think with that I leave the floor open. Uh, yes, your neighbor. Oh, sorry, was there a comment from uh, Tim there first? Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that, but I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, let's see if I can see it here somewhere. Uh, yeah, let's hear it from Tim just, first. Tim yeah. says, is simply supplying an event handler enough to discriminate? Do we actually need this surface session property? Uh, yes, it's, I think this is kind of what we have discussed in previous meetings if, if it's enough to just uh, like we, we uh, turn on the functionality based on if event handler is is uh, present or not was is that have I understood you correctly I'm just reading what Tim put in yeah. chat yes yes yeah. yes yeah so so, so in, the, in the regional proposal that I presented in December I think uh, uh, we used the callback for, instead of an event handler, and that was kind of to, to and that would then then that, that would uh, both indicate that we want to have the, have these kind of events or like uh, callbacks that 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 we want to, that uh, attract switching is happening. Uh, there was a lot of discussions around this, and, and uh, I think uh, and um, uh, I think it was Janiva, and I think maybe you and also preferred events because it's a great, more flexible model. And then when we're using event, uh, I think there is like a, a style around that, uh, that we, you should not really change behavior based on if an event handler is added or not. Uh, I mean, for, for us, I think that for me personally, I, I don't have a strong opinion on this and I could go either way here. So I can speak to that. So I dropped off the queue, but I was supposed to be in the queue. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so yes, Tim is correct, but there's uh, some design principles that discourage um, overloading whether you have an event handler or not. So, but there are also other cases where it's okay. For instance, it would be okay. It, it would probably be a bad design if browsers end up showing the end user an option or not based on whether there were event handlers. I think that would be uh, confusing, and I think an opt-in, explicit opt-in, would better, be better. And I think that reflects discussion that's happened so far. Uh, there's an other question. We haven't talked about stopping tracks here, uh, which is um, 
also uh, a bit of a rabbit hole, so I'll try to avoid that. But also, it might be okay. I think in the discussion on GitHub, we also, I think, uh, have some agreement. I hope that it might be okay for a user agent to optimize uh, a way uh, user visible behavior uh, when it comes to uh, how quickly. There was one concern that if you don't, if you're not familiar with the media stream attack model, if you don't stop all the tracks in your application, you might end up prolonging. Uh, you might have to wait till garbage collection before indicators uh, like camera, microphone, hardware lights, but also um, permission UX in the browser disappears. It could take a couple of seconds. Yeah. So, if you if yeah. you go back uh, two slides, I think to the examples continued, I think that it might mm -hmm. illuminate what Yanni was talking about here. Yes. Yes. Um, so, and thank so, you for the presentation. I think this is very clear. Uh, but the what's missing, I think, in some of these examples is any discussion of stopping the tracks or when tracks tracks need to be stopped by the application to. And it seems we agree that. Uh, if JavaScript, in order to be, in order to be backwards compatible, we think it's okay for the user agent to optimize the case where no event listener has been added, so that yeah. you don't have to stop. Because otherwise, you have a problem. You don't know about this new event, but you're supposed to stop any tracks that get surfaced in it. Right. Yeah. So as well, the lad was on the queue, but I can unfortunately not see the queue here. But but uh, but I I just wanted to answer John John Lever first here. So, so in this slide here, uh, um, uh, so, so so there are like design choices we can make here, uh, and I think that the original way I presented this is that you always get the both tracks, uh, and in that that case you have a problem of like if you are only, if I'm only interested in in the surface track, I get this extra session stream here which I'm not interested in, and then I need to do something about that. And and uh, and it's like a bit unfortunate if I need to. I think it's unfortunate if the application developer in that case get this extra stream that it needs to uh, just immediately stop because it doesn't want to have this lingering stream that we we don't really know when it will be garbage collected, and which will be surfaced in form of uh, uh, yeah privacy indicators in the browser UI. Uh, so so it's, what I think would be preferable is that that it, why why not just let the application uh, request the tracks that it wants. So the, in that way, we don't get any extra uh, streams that we need to handle. Uh, and the optimization, I think you are just talking about is a, is a, was, is a way that it, it works in the other direction if, you have, if you're only interested in a session stream, but, but it doesn't really work for the case of, of uh, uh, yeah, when, when we uh, only want to surface track. So, so yeah, I don't know if you uh, think this is a very bad so idea I'm, this way. <laughs> Well, uh, it's a little, um, I guess I have a question about the opt-in. So if I opt in to uh, surface tracks, what gets returned by get display medium? Yes, uh, so so that that's, uh, so uh, I tried to be a bit smart and a bit clever here, maybe a bit too clever. So so I, I wanted to kind of preserve the, like using the return value for the injection model and uh, and uh, and use event for, for um, surface tracks. I'm I'm not hundred percent sure that this is a good idea, uh, but so if uh, you only sh uh, ask for surface tracks, as I as I've written right now, you would not get anything back. You would just get null there. We could also have an, uh, the, the alternative that if you only ask for surface track, you get this, the first surface track there uh, instead of the event or like in addition to the event. These are details I think that we should try to resolve. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I think. Lad might want to answer this also. Yes, I think he has another view of this. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I uh, I would just like to uh, suggest something to consider, but we don't have to uh, rabbit hole on this right now. Uh, the idea is, what if uh, we had a getter for the session track, but we only returned the... Uh, I'm sorry, I uh, could you go back a couple of slides just so I can have in front of my eyes the um, the nomenclature here? Um, no, could you go one back? Thank you. Here, exactly. Uh, so maybe we could uh, basically only return a surface track, but if there uh, and expose a getter on the capture controller for the session track, and that would allow you to actually transition between the models at any moment, and you don't even need to wait for events. Uh, you could even have uh, access to both of them at any given time. 
So basically, first call to get this pay meter returns a set of surface tracks. Uh, new events expose new surface tracks. And any application that is ever interested in, a, in the session track just calls the getter and receives it and can just ignore the other tracks. And of course, that leaves the question of stopping, uh, but that could be another uh, you know, very simple method on the capture controller, which I think would sidestep uh, all of the issues about stopping from multiple locations, et cetera. I think that's going to be uh, neater. So uh, let me try to present um, or, or to represent my last suggestion in GitHub here, which is that uh, I like the concepts, uh, I like the behaviors from, and I think it's a good description talking about session tracks and surface tracks, but I'm not sure, I don't see the, it also feels artificial to ask the web developer to pick one up front um, because I might switch from, I, I might share a tab and then I might switch to another tab uh, that has audio. And now I have to use a switch track model to catch up on the audio track. But from then on, I'm going to switch to other tabs that have audio and it could use an injection model. Like it's, it, I, I'm not, it seems artificial to say that these are different uh, kinds. Um, and what I was proposing, uh, which I think uh, would be simpler is that uh, we just expose both and then the application just stops the one that doesn't want. And we had some discussions about concerns. Initially, I had a lot of concerns about, um, well, what happens if the, if the application doesn't stop the, all the tracks and you get a few seconds delay from the browser UX. I'm actually not that worried about that anymore. I think uh, UN had a good point that we can optimize for uh, away this case for existing applications that aren't aware of the event. And for people who are registering event, I think it's actually status quo and compatible with the existing model that applications are supposed to call track stop on tracks they don't want anymore. Uh, Harald? Harald. Just, uh, I, I, I have the opposite confusion. I can't imagine if I, if I want to have an application write an application that handles switching of tracks, switching of surfaces, and uh, I have code that covers that that covers uh, all cases. I, I'm kind of uh, very puzzled to see, try to see a situation where I would want to cover, want to switch, want to support two different code paths for what is what I want to present it. Add to the user as one thing. So uh, choosing up front seems to me to make life simpler for the user or for the program, uh, web developer. The user, of course, is and, and one, one more abstraction away. Uh, to to Janiva's question about, uh, yeah, so, so the. Um, so if I understood what you are, you are Alex. Yeah, I have I read your last uh, uh, comment on the issue thread, but I have not have time to to formulate a response to it. Uh, but um, so your what I read you what you proposed is that that when we when we're switching uh, to a new surface, uh, you might get a new uh, a new set of tracks through the event, and you think that. Uh, you, uh, what you have kind of presented is that uh, why not let us let uh, so so we, we we may switch over to them and at the next uh, change we want my want to continue use injection model uh, so that that these these tracks that was returned through the event is now uh, surviving over to the to the second surface uh, and the 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 problem I see with that is that we lose this. Uh, um, like guarantee that one uh, track represents just one surface, which is I think is very attractive when you are when you care about what surface you're capturing, uh, because then then we we, we okay yeah we we, we got an, uh, a track through uh, we we yeah we we lose this kind of surface track that are like this in this one to one correspondence with with um, 
uh, yeah, with the, with the surface. And as I see that, that that there is a, I mean, there is a gain also in that it kind of gives application more flexibility in what it, can you do, you do a bit whatever it wants. Uh, so, but yeah, Johnny, maybe I can. Yeah, well, there might be some simplification in implementation, but I don't think the web developer needs to care about that because you still get isolation because there's a privacy principle that once you switch from one source to another, we're going to definitely switch out the source, right? So the, the old source is not going to be there. Um, so in that sense, uh, that can still be uh, solved by the user agent. But I think uh, as far as the web model, I don't see why the web developer needs to care about these two different types. So if you go back a couple of slides to your first uh, source example, Bernard, can we go back some slides? Uh, yeah, that one, yeah, let me see. Go back to the one that was just there. Sorry, uh, go forward. Yeah, there it is. Um, so here, I, th I thought this looked really good. And uh, the the only thing missing here is calling stop. So, so I think the choice here is between um, What's confusing to me, if you have an opt-in, if you're going to opt into surface tracks, you should just return those from get display media then, I think. But, but back yeah. to my proposal was, I think here, the user has a choice where they, when they get, they can register, if they don't care about surface tracks at all, I like the terminology for this discussion, uh, then don't register an event handler, don't worry about it. Um, and your, your get display media track, the session track will survive and try to injection as, as far as that model goes, right? Yeah. So, but if you do intercept the event and you want to have more control, then you can see, oh, this new stream has additional tracks. I better. Uh, so the only thing I would modify in this slide here is before source object is assigned to event.stream, you would just go through video.source object, get tracks, and stop the old tracks. And that seems to be all the web developer has to think about. If they want to, and then they always get surface tracks, right? And the only time, but this would also allow someone to make a decision at that point and write more JavaScript. Well, if this event stream, this new event stream is compatible with my uh, old existing stream, then I can just rely on injection. And I'll, instead of stopping my old video source object tracks, I'll stop the event stream tracks. So, so uh, I mean, part at least as I have defined the surface tracks in, in this uh, here, uh, uh, like one of the kind of core parts of that is that it's connected to a specific surface. So it will stop at the end of when that surface, uh, when when the capture stops for that surface, and uh, that would basically be the switch track model in that case. So if you if you would like if you if you uh, yeah if you you don't have to end it right I'm gonna let the application close it stop it just like any other track yes but uh, the question is if it should survive I mean if you have a quarter surface track that is connected to one surface and the and the user is switching to a second surface. It, I mean, it doesn't produce any more media, but no. I mean, you have to. No, that, that's true. That, 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 yes, stop may, might be the wrong terminology here. But that, uh... Uh, I think the part that's kind of missing from Ian Avar's uh, feedback is whether he sees that, like, is the issue just whether it really stops if it fires the unstopped event, or do you actually want it to keep on emitting events, uh, I'm sorry, emitting frames with the new source? And I think that the latter is. Uh, something we probably wouldn't want. So, could you just clarify which one you mean, Yaniva? So, uh, trying to understand your example. So, you're saying if the application doesn't stop either track, what should happen? Yes. Well, in that case, I think it's um, it can be up to the. Um, well, it, is that. Yeah, it can't be undesirable user, user agent because it's uh, observable by JS. Right. So you're saying if they stop neither track, what should happen? Yes, and if if you if what you want to suggest is just to not emit any frames, to be as if you were stopped but not actually mm -hmm. stopped, mm -hmm. that doesn't seem terrible. I would prefer to stop, 
but to keep on emitting frames and to get injection through that uh, seems to me uh, a very bad design. Well, the, the backwards compatible design here is injection, right? So are we, we talking about ending, uh, ending that model? Okay. Um, we've only got a minute or two left in this uh, segment. Yeah. Yeah. I think we started earlier. So uh, yeah, we have we. So maybe we should move on to the. I don't know if there is anyone who wants to have some final word here, or if we should continue discussion in the issue. So it feels uh, like it's still like some uh, like uh, discussions needed around around uh, what we actually mean with like how like the life type, life cycle of the the tracks, uh, especially the surface tracks, uh, where we don't we I don't feel that we have a clear understanding that we mean the same thing and want the same thing here. So I think that we can maybe need to leave it at that and let's just continue the discussion later. That that sounds good to me. And I, I do feel we've made progress here uh, on GitHub uh, that we got away from prevent default and other early API ideas. So I think there's something here. If we can just figure out the uh, the lifespan model that we're, we're looking for. Yeah. OK, well, thank you for your time and uh, good questions and conversation and everything. And let's continue with the next topic. Oh, it looks like I'm I'm next. All right, yes. thank you, Bernard. So uh, I have a section on media capture main and WebRTC PC, um, <clears throat> and I have about forty minutes. I think that should be plenty. I hope. So first issue is in media capture main, and uh, actually go back one, or I'll forget later, because uh, I also wanted to call out a PR. I don't have a slide for this, so. There's a PR in the Q2961 for WebRTC PC to convert the ICE candidate pair dictionary to an interface. If that sounds troubling to you, please go uh, and look at that PR and comment there. Otherwise, I think uh, this is uh, simple enough that it shouldn't worry most member participants. But we've called it out, so please go look there if, if you don't think we should convert ICE candidate pair dictionary to an interface. All right, next slide. And feel free to comment here uh, in chat or uh, raise your hand at this point if you have uh, thoughts on that or later. All right, so next, yeah, so I'm on the right slide here. <laughs> so um, the device change event, as a tried and true part of media capture main, it follows, currently follows the design rule of use plain events for state and put the state information in the target object. Unfortunately, in our case, this is good advice, except in our case, uh, the state is not available synchronously, which means you call enumerate devices, which can take uh, 100 milliseconds, by which point uh, you can get, a lot of things can have happened, including you might have gotten this event again. This was previously discussed uh, back in November. And the conclusion at that point was that there was no objection to include the devices in the device change event. And here's a, an example source uh, of JavaScript using that, this new API. You, you register, in a, you know, you do add event listener or on device change for the device change event. And part of that event is uh, a, a device that's member on the event itself. <clears throat> so I'm just presenting the PR here. Um, so there's existing language in the device exposure algorithm that talks about new exposed devices. And we're just adding a step to that queues a task to, well, in the existing uh, step, step six, where we queue a task to fire an event named device change, we now add that this is a new type with a constructor that has a device member. And the next slide is, the what that device interface looks like. So that's pretty simple. It's modeled on WebRTC PC's track event, which has a streams argument, and it takes a frozen array 
of the media devices and objects. <coughs> uh, and this is basically an object representing the current result from enumerate devices. And the question is, any thoughts on this? Any objection, objection to merging this PR? Yes, let's see the Google room. Um, you know. uh, I have some concern about the current result from enumerate devices. Because uh, what does that mean? Does I mean, current means is must it be the same that you would get if you call enumerate devices right now, and then you will get a result later? It shouldn't be just the 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 devices at at the time when uh, of the event, so, something like that. Yes, uh, I mean, current result. I mean, it's not clear to me what it would mean. Okay, no, that's a good good point. I, maybe I should rephrase that. If you go back a slide. To the previous slide, uh, you are correct. It's actually the devices at the time of the event is fired from the new exposed devices. So that's an existing. It turns out that device change event already needs to have effectively called the internal version of a numerate device. It needs to enumerate devices by creating a list of device info objects. So it has this information already. It's just not exposing it at that time. So that would be equivalent to, it's an internal equivalent of what enumerate devices would produce, but it's totally synchronous. Uh, so maybe I should, yeah, I'll, I'll take an issue to, I'll take a note to update the PR to not suggest or to just that information similar to what one would have gotten through enumerate devices or something like that. Does that work? Yeah, yeah some language that, uh, uh, I mean, in general, I, um, I agree with the change, but uh, yeah, with the, uh, I would like a uh, yeah, clearer language. Uh, okay. For, for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take an action to clarify that language. Anyway, is there an internal thought we could be referencing from here, or is that not part of uh, any thought? Um, <clears throat> There is an internal slot. It's called a stored list, but it has more information, unfortunately, than uh, what's exposed. <coughs> it's an internal yeah. list. Yeah. Shipping away information is usually easy. <laughs> yes. So as far as I could tell, creating a list of device info objects okay. translates that internal slot into an exposable list, because there are a lot of uh, privacy and security uh, filtering happening on it. All right, so I'll I'll just um, try to get this merged at the next editor's meeting then. All right, thank you. All right, so now we're over in uh, WebRTC PC land and apologies for filing this quite recently. Uh, Firefox is implementing set codec preferences and this surfaced a lot of questions internally that, um, and some of them we were able to answer and others were on the spec. So we uh, were been playing around with it. And one of the benefits of that was that we started asking questions. Well, what happens? Uh, I can make this nice fiddle that calls set codec preferences uh, to change it live, basically. Um, but and that works because set codec preferences overrides the default receive codec preferences used by the user agent. But negotiation is needed before those changes affect transmission and can be seen live. So I encourage you to try that fiddle if you have that link. Uh, it works uh, pretty well. Uh, it doesn't work in Firefox yet because we haven't, uh, we need to land that in 127. Um, but what's a little weird when writing that fiddle, I had to. I kind of expected set codec preferences to trigger negotiation needed. But of course, it doesn't do so. So the fiddle has to call its own, do its own manual negotiation, basically, as a workaround. But unfortunately, these uh, there's a lot of timing issues around negotiation. So it would be much better uh, if I didn't have to add this hack, this workaround. 
So the proposal is fairly simple to say. It's to make set codec preferences trigger negotiation needed as needed. Now, there's some details. So that's the first question, is it's a good idea. Uh, and then the second part is clarifying what as needed means. Uh, it might require some judgment. Um, it's sometimes desirable, for instance, to call set codec preferences when you're in have remote offer, meaning during a negotiation, you've just received an, a remote, uh, an offer from the remote side. Um, and you might want to change, use set codec preferences to affect your answer based on that information. Um, and, but since answers carry as much weight as offers, sometimes more uh, from my understanding, and please clarify if I'm wrong about this, but it might seem undesirable to trigger what would be a reverse role re negotiation in this case. Uh, and so this has to do with uh, working out, we need to work out these details in the check if negotiation is needed algorithm. And I found some similar language there around things like transceiver direction that we might be able to take advantage of. So the goal here, I think, would be to basically be satisfied with a match in the local description, regardless of whether it's an offer or an answer. And say, you know, if there's a match, if the current offer or answer in the local descriptions uh, is offering the same codex as uh, set codec preferences uh, suggest, then it doesn't need negotiation needed. That then no negotiation is needed, and we don't fire the negotiation needed event when we get back to stable. So that was the special case. But and of course, in, in the more common case, you call set codec preferences in stable before you're sending it, creating an offer. And in that case, triggering negotiation needed seems appropriate be because that's what we do for uh, all the other API methods like add transceiver, uh, set direction, anything that requires negotiation to uh, for its effect to take effect. Yeah, that's English. Uh, uh, <laughs> seems to trigger this event, so we should be consistent. Does that make sense? I kind of wonder. And I can start in only here now. And because uh, the thing with set code preferences is when does it make a difference? And uh, as you said, when you are already in 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 the middle of a negotiation, then then. Uh, that codec preferences will make a difference in the answer, but then you're already in a in a, in an offer answer, and uh, it doesn't really have any effect on on local state. It's trying to influence remote state, which can only happen after negotiate negotiation, as you say. So. I'm a bit puzzled about uh, this uh, as needed part. It would actually be simpler if uh, if you just fired negotiation needed. Uh, see, negotiation needed is fi fired on return to stable, isn't it? Uh, in the special case, if we're talking about the special case of um, calling set code of preferences and have remote offer, yes, there are some cases. A negotiation needed where changes are made. Uh, and normally what you want to have happen when you come back to stable, everything has been negotiated and both sides are happy. And there are corner cases where one side might go, well, I'm not happy because I added a transceiver in, while I was in have remote offer. And for some corner case reasons that are, I don't want to go into too deeply, uh, you still have to basically do a, a second negotiation and trigger negotiation needed again. So there's a lot of complexity there, but it sounds like, uh, Harald, you agree with the original premise that it would be nicer. It sounds like you're saying uh, triggering negotiation needed is good, 
but you're disagreeing with the optimization, or am I misunderstanding? I'm uh, I'm trying to figure out to when it's appropriate mm -hmm. to fire or not to fire. So it, we could, for instance, say that that so when we return to a stable state, we fire negotiation needed if the if the list set by set caller preferences is different from the list in the local right. uh, local description. Yes, I, I think this is something that it would end up saying. Yes, so yeah, so we're uh, correct. So I'm, so I'm thinking that set caller preferences with no change shouldn't make a difference. Agreed. Yes. Um, including set caller preferences with uh, with a list that is then uh, trimmed by the negotiation down yes. to some something that doesn't have a, have a difference. So that might that might be a reasonable uh, hack to check check if negotiation is needed. Yes. So basically, if there's a match in the local description, whether it's an offer or an answer, it's a stable, then it uh, negotiation is not needed anymore. Yeah. So that 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 means that we have to have a local local uh, uh, turn slot to keep the keep the argument from the last <laughs> set set color preferences, so that we can so that I have something to compare it to. Uh, unless we can hand wave about it, yes. Um, uh, hand waving I mean, is so hard to implement. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that is probably going to be necessary then. Yeah. Uh, so that is if we want to optimize all the cases where set coded preferences uh, looks like it might make a change, but for some before reasons, uh, it ends up being filtered out or something and not making a change. Um, yeah, that, there might be some details there to figure out. But um, but the original premise makes sense, right? Like I have a fiddle, <clears throat> and it's already running. It's sending. Uh, you know, I didn't pick a codec. I picked default, which means different browsers will send what they prefer. <laughs> and then while it's sending, I can switch it to something else, like VP9 or Azure 264. And it, it triggers the negotiation needed event. Negotiation happens uh, in a way that is pretty timing safe, and uh, I, I the result updates. Yeah, oh, I see Florent on the queue. So um, I, I think it's a nice idea to uh, want uh, negotiation needed to be uh, triggered by set correct preferences. Uh, I am worried, though, that we might run into some backward compatibility issues because this uh, set collect preferences behavior uh, has uh, the current behavior has shipped for a very long time in a lot of applications uh, on multiple user agents. I'm afraid that it could cause some uh, issues in with applications if we trigger negotiation needed in times where they wouldn't necessarily expect it. And uh, they could be in the middle of reconfiguring um, everything, and then suddenly negotiation is needed, and it happens. They didn't intend to do it then. So that, uh, because of those reasons, I'm not sure that it's a great idea to move forward with this. Um, we had in the documentation, uh, I believe, some lines that might not have been clear enough let's say that uh, we you, those settings don't apply until you renegotiate and maybe we want to uh, improve on that that could be another way forward but uh, because of the complexity of uh, all the edge cases where we don't want to trigger a negotiation needed and uh, for uh, all the backward compatibility issues that we could have in existing applications, I'm not sure we should move forward with this. So it, I agree web compatibility is a concern, but I think also that uh, the way we've, we've specified negotiation needed is already quite sensitive to timing issues. Like it would only fire, well, first off, it would queue a task and it would only fire if it's not already negotiating. So it already takes, and it would also only fire if the operations queue is empty. 
So I would say, um, and, and the negotiation issues you might run into are the same negotiation issues to some extent you would run into by trying to do this manually, I feel. So I, I think it's an overall net win to uh, fire. Uh, if we trade problems, I think um, it's a net win to, to have a fire negotiation needed, even though yeah. I do have some concerns with the transition and, you know, how to transition existing websites and, and maybe do some research to see who, who gets tripped up by it, if any. I think we, uh, it's not about trading problem, it's about trading, um, uh, well, some work for one implementer uh, with work from users. Um, we It is already used uh, without any problems by a lot of applications already uh, that are uh, widely deployed and used by millions of people. Uh, so I'm not sure that um, because we had one person having an issue in a fiddle that we should just amend the spec for this. It's something that we could have designed better from the start, I think. Uh, we could have done this from the start and, and all, but we also had a, a the time precedent where we wanted to not trigger negotiation needed um, on everything and we're clear that this doesn't apply then. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure that we necessarily want to address this because it could have some issues. As you said, uh, it's probably not causing issues, but it could uh, because uh, negotiation needed is triggered on very clear set of um, API calls. And if you don't expect it, uh, you shouldn't necessarily have it. And uh, adding it to uh, existing um, API calls is potentially breaking. So we need to make a good analysis on uh, whether it uh, changes behavior for uh, any applications uh, first. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Uh, I, I would think that, I would like to clarify that if you're not using the negotiation needed event, there is no issue here. So applications that have complicated uh, negotiation logic that it prefers to deal with manually uh, should not be affected by this. And also, if you're calling set coded preferences in have remote offer, for example, you would not be affected by this uh, if we get the, you know, assuming we get the language right here. So the issue would be if you're calling set coded preferences in stable and you're about to call your own negotiation next, uh, I don't think you should be affected by this. You might get this event. Oh, yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. In this case, it's probably fine but if you were not in, if you were intending to make other changes that were a little bit later and it would trigger in the middle of what i would call okay. some sort of transaction where you're updating what you're setting then you could get into a state that you wouldn't expect and that's what i'm uh, afraid of mm. um applications were not built uh, to avoid this, so that is okay. share breaking change. That's uh, okay. my main issue. Secondly, uh, yeah, it's I think going to be complicated to um, specify which cases as needed uh, is that going to be uh, um, concerned by. It. So it's going to be tricky, and uh, because of that, I don't think it's uh, we should go forward with this. We should have written the spec in uh, maybe like that in the first place, but it's a bit late now. And we might want to have some alternative ways to um, have similar behavior, maybe an extra parameter, for example, in the transceivers in it that takes the correct preferences. So we'll know uh, a transceiver has uh, triggers negotiation needed. So maybe uh, we should have a way to pass correct preferences there that could avoid to have two calls and one of them triggers negotiation needed. The second one could also trigger it, but then we just have one call. So maybe that could be fine. Uh, I think those are other alternatives that we could um, explore to improve the API shape uh, in some way. It doesn't cover everything, but it does cover some right. cases. Well, thank you. I understand the concern. I think we should uh, maybe finish. Uh, we should continue in the GitHub issue to 
to document those concerns, uh, unless there are other opinions in the group. Uh, I think we can uh, move on. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, a second issue I filed uh, as we're also implementing um, a missing codex parameter in Firefox for get parameters. Um, we ran into an issue and I want to present to the group here. Um, receiver get parameters has this non-normative note. Well, th it has a normative step, but th there's also a note that implies a lot of functionality that is no longer in the spec as far as we can tell. So it says both the local and remote description may affect the list of codecs that's returned from get parameters. For example, and then it's giving an example. If three codecs are offered, the receiver will be, will be prepared to receive each of them and will return them all from get parameters. But if the remote endpoint only answers with two, the absence codecs will no longer be returned by get parameters and the receiver no longer needs to be prepared to receive it. So this su suggests that post that remote description answer, receiver get parameters codecs is updated to only reflect what's been negotiated. And this matches what I've been able to discern from implementation. But there are no norm normative steps in the spec to support this <laughs> right now. It says receive codex is initialized to the implemented implemented receive codex list. And it's only ever assigned in the case of rollback. And it does not appear to be modified. And the enabled flag is only ever set to true. So when I filed this, I was confused, uh, but I've done some research since then, so I've added some more slides. Uh, and we still need to clarify what was the intent here. Uh, so next slide. <clears throat> um, oh yeah, so first I have the slide to go through expected behavior. Um, so dissecting the note, um, it seems to be uh, helpful to look at an example. Let's say, uh, a browser has like 10 enabled codecs total. So ahead of set local description offer, based on this note, I would expect either zero or 10 codecs. Uh, implementations today seem to have zero based on the fiddle I tested with. Excuse me, and there's a, there's a reason for that because that's what the 1.0 spec says. And then there has been a recent change to that. But also after set local description offer, it should say three codecs based on the example. <clears throat> and after set remote description answer, it should say two codecs. And the same seems to be true if the roles are reversed based on the note. So that's the behavior. And also that seems to be how browsers are working right now. I only had a few minutes before the meeting to double check that. <clears throat> So uh, uh, here's what seemed to have happened. Next slide. Is that this turns out to be a regression from uh, a recent issue where we added the enable flag. <clears throat> so prior to that PR, it said the following, it said local description. It said set transceiver receiver receive codex to the codex that the description negotiates for receiving and which the use agent is currently prepared to receive. <clears throat> So since this is in set local description, that means that uh, as soon as you have, as you start negotiation, uh, there you have a remote offer or have remote, um, have local offer, <laughs> then receive codex is populated with, with what has been negotiated. And it says that if there's send only and inactive, the receiver is not prepared to receive anything and the list will be empty. In addition, it also said, let receivers have a, when you create a transceiver, the receive, the receive codex internal slot is initialized to an empty list. So it starts out empty and it's then populated based on negotiation, which may turn out to be empty or non-empty. Uh, next slide. So but when we added the enable flag, this got, this got replaced with the following code, which seems broken because the enabled flag is only ever set to true. Um, so 
<coughs> and in addition, we also updated the create the transceiver initialization of receive codex to represent uh, to be initialized by the list of implemented receive codex with the enabled flag set to an implementation defined manner. So now it starts out being entirely implementation defined, whether it's empty or includes a full set or something in between. And then the enabled flag is only ever set to true. After that, never to false. So this means it cannot possibly represent. So when you call get parameters codex uh, during negotiation or after negotiation, this does not seem to support returning only the subset of codex that were negotiated. And that seems broken. So um, Harald, I know you, you uh, made some changes here with the enabled flag. And I'm wondering if, if uh, uh, I'm a little, so we're trying to implement this now. So we're a little confused. <laughs> I was hoping you could shed some light on, yeah. on this. What I was thinking. So uh, the attempt I made was to, to make sure that we have a list that contains everything we can possibly negotiate, at least uh, the conceptual list. And uh, and where uh, we could add this, add to this dynamically over time. See previous uh, previous topic, and um, and that had to be per transceiver. Uh, so uh, frankly, I missed this uh, this particular usage of the list, or missed uh, or didn't look at it well enough. So we basically have to decide what we want to represent. Uh, if we want to, we want to make sure that we represent only, uh, only codex that we are able to receive at the moment. And uh, I mean, unimplemented codex cannot be received, of course. Uh, so we could do this by receive codex enabled flag, meaning meaning currently willing to receive rather than than uh, ever willing to receive. That is to say that it needs to match the the match the codec list from the from the recently accepted the. Uh, uh, the most recently accepted offer, or uh, most recently accepted uh, local description, because the local description is what says what you are able to, what, what you are willing to receive, which then would set. Uh, um, with, which then would have to add a, add a step here saying that set set all the enable flag of all the script of all all uh, all all the receive codex to false. Yeah, no, sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm happy to continue discussing it in issue. I just want to call out that uh, we did do some research and find out that we seem to have figured out that. Uh, there was an earlier intent here of, uh, and we should probably restore uh, current yeah. behavior. Uh, so, yeah. so we, so we want, if if we agree that we want to represent uh, receiver dot get parameters dot codex, this, the the this is not a a static method, right? This is dynamic method. It's right, individual receiver. Yes, yes, and. Uh, and if I we think agree that, that the, the that the point of having this is to represent the list of codex that we currently are able to receive, then I think we can fix this description. That is my uh, yeah. I don't know if Bernard, you have other comments on this, but it seems to me that this was always the intent to replace SDP reading SDP. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. And uh, and then also, uh, Florent, I know uh, we also found some web platform tests with the new uh, codec feature for set parameters that might rely on uh, on this. So I also had a question of, but it, it seemed to assume that um, maybe I'm mistaken on this. But there was also, if you go back a slide, there was also the question of should it initially be empty or not? I think it should be empty, yes, because we haven't okay. negotiated anything, which right. is a similar behavior that we have on the sender side. Okay. Uh, before yes. negotiation, you don't have any header extensions or codecs because they haven't been negotiated. Yeah. And I believe this applies, this, these slides apply the same codecs as well. I just wasn't able to. Uh, to um, add slides for that in time or comment on the issue. So, uh, and I think the the same concerns uh, affect send codex, but I'm not 100% sure. I yeah. hope that they're not uh, too broken, but the the receive side has been <clears throat> neglected for a, a while. I don't think we have <clears throat> made a lot of efforts on it. So. Uh, I'm not surprised there are some broken behavior and any effort to actually clean this up are very welcome. Thank you. Uh, five minutes left in this section. Uh, yes, so I just wanted to make sure that um, there was also, with the enable flag, there was an implementation defined component to it. And uh, I was just want to make sure that we had a understanding of, of the intent there. If Harold, you could speak to that. Yeah. So I think uh, I think then that we can can probably agree on uh, saying that the, the intent is to represent the currently negotiated codex, and uh, we should in, initialize it to to all all false, and then when when we make an offer, we start setting th things to true. All right. So I was think I was thinking when I when I wrote the the flag the flag that uh, we would pick up all the codecs that were marked true and propose them in the in the in the send receive or receive only co uh, sections. I'd have to scratch my head more about that. It kind of goes right. both ways. So so one thing we noticed with set codec preferences is that if you take the if you call the static receiver uh, get capabilities method and you get all the codecs and you you call set codec preferences with that array uh, people might think that that's a no op but it's actually not a no op as far as i can tell in jsep and because sending it to the empty array would be the no, the default uh, uh, which would i guess and the difference would be that if you set the full array you're restricting the browser to use all the codecs in that array in that specific order Whereas if you set an empty array, presumably the use agent uh, is more has more flexibility to both based on order and what to include. Uh, Florian? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the okay. big difference is going to be, um, be the defaults of the current browser might be different. And um, on future renegotiation, if more codecs are added, uh, you want to probably not prevent them from being added if you were to add on to the sender side as uh, codec preferences. Someone added AV2, you just don't want to ignore it because you, you might support it. So it's not necessarily a no up. It doesn't do that much, but in the future, it might have some side effects. That's all. Okay, thank you. This uh, feedback was very valuable, so I'm happy. Thanks. Okay, next. Hi. Uh, right, thanks. Uh, a quick recap. Uh, background blur is behind a flag in upstream Chrome and Edge. Uh, background blur code actually for WebKit landed in Safari a few weeks ago. So thanks to UN. I don't think UN is here today, but yeah, thanks. So users can try out 
uh, in the next uh, tech preview for Safari, uh, it's always good to have a second implementation experience. So when we started uh, background blur, we always thought of background replacement work also. But at that time, there was not much platform support. So we bucketed it to the future work list. So, But now uh, things have changed. And uh, that's why we are here. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. I need yeah, it's just uh, so in this demo, we are using transform stream to pre-process frames uh, before displaying on a video element. The demo always keeps the last mask frame, but does not pass them to the video element, except for this demo purposes, of course. So when the demo receives an original frame, we use that frame and the last mask frame to create a new video frame with foreground coloring options with blue and enqueue it to, the pass, to be passed to the video element instead of the original and mask frame. So like always, our objective is to get the best uh, power and performance for workloads and utilize the underlying hardware in the best possible way. Here you can see that the segmentation compute actually happens on NPU, which is like a TPU in Google parlance. So off CPU and on GPU, so which makes it very efficient. Uh, at, we have prototyped this on Windows right now, so on Windows 11 22H2. Uh, there is a case kernel streaming property called uh, camera metadata background segmentation mask, similar to uh, Blur, which contains a bounding box of processed uh, mask area in the original image coordinates. There's a mask resolution. Uh, there's a bounding box of the foreground pixels within the mask and the mask data, which is like the important one. So, and mask, mask data has to be extended to cover the entire full video frame. And we have to convert it to this video frame for Matt in Chrome, it's NV12 by adding some static chroma blue and chroma red. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. In terms of API shape, both the background blur and the background segmentation mask have very similar, like, but separate uh, media stream capabilities, constraint, and settings. The difference uh, come in the data. So, in background blur. We, uh, the background blur actually pre-processes the video frames and replaces the original video frame with the ones with the blurred background blurred frames. Thus, the uh, original video frame becomes unavailable from the web application uh, until, again, the blur is disabled. But in background mask, it retains the original frame intact, does segmentation, and provides mask frames in addition to the original frames. Thus, web applications receive like both the original frame and the mask frame in the same stream. Like it, you can think it's like doubling the frame rate, but yeah, it's like keeping the original stream and adding a synthetic frame, uh, which is like the marks, uh, masks frame. So in background mask, uh, web applications can separate the original and from the mask frame. And for that, we are adding a Boolean to the video frame metadata, uh, as you can see here. Okay. Uh, the mask frames are grayscale, 
uh, at least on Windows, the internal video format is not limited to grayscale. It could be RGB, but just for demo purposes, we did like that. Yeah. So I wanted to keep a lot of time for questions. So because you guys are aware of this, but uh, uh, let's get into questions. And uh, we'll put up a PR sometime this week, and then we can go over the details. But this was just to give you an uh, idea of what might come. So I saw Ella there having, trying to raise a hand. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> right. uh, this looks very interesting. And apologies if this was actually answered while my kid was distracting me. Uh, but why did I understand correctly that you inserted an additional, like you interleaved it with different frames? And if so, was that only for demo purposes? And is the intention actually to just expose this on the actual frames? Uh, so uh, the camera, uh, the driver, let's say the driver will add uh, extra uh, mask data and we can create the, we can have uh, this mask frame there. So uh, if you go to the, maybe the code, maybe the last uh, slide, the previous slide, yeah. Okay, I don't think it's visible, right? So can you have a look at the code section? No. So, so we just check, check whether it's the original frame or the mask frame and then uh, do some uh, canvas operations to whatever replace all those things. So if I understand correctly, you get an interleaving streams of mask frames, actual frames, mask frames, actual frames? Did I yes. I, and then yes. extra frame uh, apply to the preceding or to the subsequent frame? OK. Uh, let me hold on. Arrow. Uh, you, yes. you can answer uh, that. Yes, so uh, order is but first, first and mask frame and then original frame. Thank you. Of course, um, it could be changed. But. Okay. So thank, thank you so much. And I would point out that this could be a little bit confusing. And I understand that maybe for demo purposes, it was easier to hack it together like that. I just wonder whether uh, we could combine the two and just make sure that the actual frame is already emitted with this metadata. Uh, as a form of some new uh, field instead of as an additional frame. It seems to me like it might be more ergonomic that way. Also, it would avoid certain edge cases where you might get a certain frame and then maybe you're closing or maybe you're now you need to wait and something happens asynchronously as you're waiting for the next one. So just getting all of the data at the same time seems easier. And just to clarify, like this looks great. Right. Yes. Uh, I think, yeah, w when we added that synthetic frame, it was easier for us to do the demo. But uh, um, yes, we could add something like you are suggesting. Uh, in, uh, but I think there was some comment, I can't remember by whom, but somebody, maybe me, team, I can't remember, that uh, it was a comment during the blur times that we need to keep a original one also and a processed one so that uh, just in case we want to uh, like an app wants to work on top of the original one and also i mean uh, because people have different use cases you don't know uh, with you might want to work a blur on top of this segmentation like it is very much possible you can you can add a bokeh effect on top of this segmentation and it will look like a blur so uh, sorry harold i don't intend to uh, jump the queue i'm just a clarification for my own question uh so the way i understood is that you emit the original frame unmodified and the mask is that did i maybe yes. understand that yes Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> because those two things are tightly coupled, you don't need to emit them separately. You can emit them 
together, where one is actually maybe just some metadata added to the other one. So the unmodified frame would be emitted as it is today. And the mask frame that you would have emitted, maybe that could just be some metadata on top of the of the frame. That was what I was trying to suggest. Okay. Uh, so th this reminds me a lot of uh, discussions about uh, alpha channel and uh, segmentation masks earlier, where the whole uh, the discussion was uh, very much about the shape of the metadata and where do you carry the metadata. So this particular way of doing it has an Another interesting aspect, which is how do you transmit it? Of course, that's uh, a question with any any kind of metadata. And so, in this case, uh, if you were to tell an encoder to encode uh, uh, picture frame, mask frame, picture frame, mask frame, as if they were just frames, then compression compression would go completely bananas because uh, the frames would be so different. But uh, if you have metadata, then you have the problem that you have to specify the metadata and how to carry it and how to uh, deal with it. Uh, did you consider doing alpha, uh, a complete alpha instead of just having a mask? Aero tried, the alpha, uh, tried to put the mask data in the alpha channel. Aero, you want to start? Uh, Talk about yeah. that. Yes, so in Chrome implementation, uh, it's an uh, TPU buffer which doesn't have an alpha channel. So I uh, thought that it would be quite difficult to add, uh, add the alpha channel to the original frame. So uh, for the encoder question, I will leave that to Bernard. I think it's probably eager to comment, but let's not hear what Janiva wants to say. Uh, yeah, so, so I would like to second what Hal's saying is that alpha channel seems just intuitively uh, a, a, a more, uh, a, a perhaps a better place, unless there's some reason alpha channel wouldn't work um, that is inherent. Uh, I mean, implementation, I mean, long, the long view seems to be that if alpha channel can support this, then that might solve a lot of encoding issues. I understand there are some encoders that support alpha channel and uh, avoids the concerns that uh, that Harold mentioned with encoding. Um, but my original question was more about, uh, I thought you were about to propose a background replacement constraint, but that's not what this is, right? This is a, right. a background so mask. If you look at the demo, you can just yeah. uh, uh, you can put an image. So once you get the mask data, what you do is up to applications. It takes few lines of code. If the the code is there, instead of putting green, you just replace with image. So, but just so I understand, this is a proposal where the if this constraint return is. Re if get settings returns true for this constraint, it would it, it would be because uh, it would emi it can, be emitting it can these support extra mask it, frames that you're proposing. Yes, yes, okay. yes, yeah. All right, I just want to clarify. So this is this is not about user agents because you, you introduced it as blur and then background replacement, which I guess would <laughs> right. be a separate request. Okay. Yes. So this is basically mask, and you can do basically replacement or anything yep. green screen jif anything uh, yeah in that case I, I would just echo what harold said and uh, if we we can explore alpha channel as an alternative okay maybe yes. I, I i'll reach out to uh, guido or Ella because we tried the alpha channel maybe we did not know exactly what to do so i'd reach out for that a uh, request for clarification for harold and Yenevor. um 
If I understand correctly, the um, you're proposing the alpha channel because that's something that would already get encoded and transmitted remotely. Uh, but I'm kind of uh, imagining this more something that was supposed to be consumed locally. And then if an application actually wants to trans transmit it remotely, uh, perhaps to some, you know, uh, cloud based, uh, you know, background replacement service or something like that, it could define its own way of doing that. But often I would expect this to just be consumed locally, replaced with some image and then discarded and then the use of an alpha channel would only require an additional step of removing that alpha channel before transmitting. So that seems to me, at least for that use case, that would be counterproductive. So um, did I get that right? Maybe. I'm, uh, the question is, uh, is whether we consider that having metadata for a frame put into the the processing model as a, as a next frame is viable and whether we can filter the, them out when we when we need to filter them out and whether we ever want to transmit them so i'm kind of uh, i don't know if we, i don't know if we're going going to solve one problem or all problems but uh, at least we should think about it. I don't know if alpha channel is a solution. I just know that we've discussed alpha channel and as far as I know, we're doing very badly at uh, at actually specifying something something for, for use of alpha channel. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I would agree with Harold there. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on alpha channel either, but uh, I, I've heard of alpha channel before. I haven't heard of alternating mask frames before. So uh, we have to figure out uh, yeah, what, the, what is the, more generally useful, the, both locally yes. and perhaps in a remote basis. Yes, yeah, since this mask data could be a bit bigger, um, like <laughs> bounding box, grayscale in bounding box. So we just tried this trick. I don't know, just for a demo. But of course, oh. uh, I could imagine. Sorry, I could imagine perhaps sending the alpha channel to a server might be useful to create, you know, together modes and that kind of stuff, uh, right? So if you had a media server of some kind, but you know, if you didn't want to do this, uh, you know, there are different ways you could yeah. do it client side, you could do it server side. I yeah, think but it's like, been, what the report has been waiting for a bit, so maybe uh, maybe we should bench this and uh, let him talk. Bernard. Come on. Yeah, uh, just just a few things. Um, uh, currently, we're not doing a great job of uh, supporting the alpha channel, like Web Codex doesn't support alpha channel. Also, in some codecs, like AV1, we're just in the process of adding support for alpha. So I would say overall in the, in the platform that that might be something we want to work on, uh, is, is to figure out how to support that well. But currently, there are a lot of, a lot of holes. Yeah, that's why our demo did not work properly, maybe when we tried the alpha channel thing. Yeah, although uh, I would encourage you to file uh, bugs or spec issues, because I think we know that this is a weak area. OK, yeah, but what Elad was, Elad was saying is mainly true, that this is only mo mo mostly going to be mostly for local for consumption. Right, right. right. Yeah. Local consumption. Yeah. but. Uh, of course, I hadn't thought about again taking that and putting to encoders. So. Frederick. Yeah, I just wanted to ask whether the API shape overall is sustainable. Say that we want to add more fe features going forward, like gestures, face landmarks, face detection, that sort of thing. Will it fit within the model of adding more metadata to frames? Uh, great question. We were working on phase detection, and we also wanted to add a bit of metadata to video frames. Uh, and yeah, we'll restart that conversation. But uh, is there any suggestion you want to make? Do you want to bucket it somewhere like? Uh, no, I'm just asking the question. I, I want the, uh, right. the overall 
thing to to look nice when we're we're at the end of the the things that right. we anticipate that will add. Right. So um, there was a discussion, actually, I read you, I should alert you to this, in the media working group last meeting about uh, adding stuff to the video frames. Uh, but that discussion was mostly about whether there's anything that the encoders and decoders should do with that metadata. Uh, and there was some confusion about it. But the bottom line is Web Codex does kind of ignores everything you put in there, which I think is you don't care either way. But. But is it is it transmitted to the other side? No. Yeah, nothing. So you, if you put the stuff in the video frame, put it in the encoder, it doesn't come out in the encoder chunk. Basically, it, yeah, it just it's gets dropped. dropped. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but so, yeah, Frederick's point is nice because we also tried that in phase detection. Again, we are planning to add into this. So yeah. Sorry, Janibar. Oh, yeah. Th th no, thanks. Th Frederick's feedback just reminded me of some of my comments on the, the face detection as well, which was that is there a reason this feature needs to be tied to the driver of the camera? And uh, are we veering into general graphics territory? And might there be other working groups that could work on any source and do masking on any source? Yeah, I I'll come back with phase detection after a few <laughs> months because uh, it's not giving that level like of course uh, but these are more priority because the gains you will see for background blur and segmentation are uh, 2x 3x than uh, present state of the art so so that th this is why this is more priority for us right now. But we'll come back when the face detection, we get that kind of thing, which will happen soon. Uh, we'll definitely come back. Well, uh, but I was, I was giving the mm. same feedback to this feature. Is, is there something with masking that has to be done uh, as part of the constraints on the camera? Uh, couldn't oh. this also be done are there unique properties that you get from the driver this, here? So I can talk about Windows and Mac right now. So this works on any cameras on Windows and Mac. Uh, it doesn't need, like, so the OEM only has to plug into Windows Studio FX. So if you have seen Windows Studio FX, it's on Windows, it is going to use that and on mac it is going to use their vision framework so whatever the, whatever the best models are already present in your system on your laptop we are just uh, bubbling up it to the web because all the people below have already optimized these things for uh for native uh, teams like for, for so this is available native as you as far you're saying yeah, so if you just yeah. if you have a Windows 11 twin, uh, laptop and you have a new like relatively new machine, uh, uh, Meteor uh, it works Meteor Lake, Snapdragon Elite or AMD Seven Series, uh, it will work just like that. So it's already a real, I have this Meteor Lake machine here at where I am trying out. Uh, it's all available in the and and from now on any any hardware manufacturer which who create any laptops will have it so it's nothing but, intel or amd or camera nothing but the way it's available in native is it also tied to the camera yeah so if you just okay. open the camera app you can check okay all right thanks mm -hmm. So what controls what uh, what gets masked? Uh, yeah, it. I mean, right now it's only the like background and foreground. It's not a segment of anything model. So. <laughs> yeah. So it's back background foreground. No yeah. sense yeah. goes to the wall. <laughs> yeah. 
I am. I don't have more comments. Okay. I have no conclusions. So for the okay. meeting notes, do we have any uh, uh, summary or action, next steps or action items? Yes, yeah, so I, I think our next, like if there's, if, if you, if the audience here thinks it's sort of useful, and uh, because uh, when we started background blur, there was a feedback that, hey, uh, mask would be more important than blur because it's more general, something like that. So so if you think it's useful, we can start off with a PR and then we can iterate on the shape and we can also start to start this intent to uh, prototype stuff. And yeah, behind the flag, just like blur, people can try out on their machines and uh, give feedback. Of course, guess, we'll start off with the PR first. Yes, sorry. I guess my concern is that if we're veering into general purpose graphics APIs here, like Harold asked, you know, what determines the mask? And then there's going to be uh, more issues about how to control the mask and it bec becomes its own control surface. and. And I think for background blur, our hand was sort of forth because this was a feature in user agents, uh, sorry, in, in operating systems that was causing difficulties for applications who were also trying to do the same thing and you want to identify. So I think the arguments there was slightly different. So I think here I would be very nervous about opening uh, up for potentially a lot of you know, as as a small vendor, also we're worried about function, adding a lot of functionality that we'd have to support to make competitive and compatible. So, I think uh, we have some concerns uh, with uh, this being an open end, uh, potentially an open ended uh, area, and not just an API surface to detect uh, existing OS functionality. Okay, so like uh, the, you're fine with blur, but not with this. I'm just trying to understand because it's almost same. Uh, yes, I think blur, blur. Uh, we're we're fine with blur. I don't think this is in the same category necessarily because this adds additional uh, functionality um, beyond what might be reasonable to support for our camera. And it might be better presented as a, uh, right. you know, why, why shouldn't we be able to do this masking? Maybe that fits more in, in, in a graphics uh, library where you can do this with any source, not just from a camera, for example. Right. OK. Of course, uh, I come from an implementation background, so I know why yeah. uh, that is happening. Uh, uh, but uh, so, uh, like replacement, mm -hmm. background replacement, or those things are uh, are same category as blur. And mm -hmm. anybody who like, if you want to do a background replacement, this is the first step. Okay. So, so whether you want yeah. to you use a green screen or an image for background replacement, you have to mm -hmm. do this first. So this is an so, aid of a very. Uh, general purpose, well, a specific use case, I should say, of background replacement in video conferencing. Yes, it, it is meant only, f mainly for video conferencing only, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, because I did not want to create one API for background replacement, one for green screen, one for this. Uh, mm -hmm. You you just use green color for green screen and that kind of thing. So this is basically for background replacement first step, and you let the application, for example, the team or meet or uh, whereby to replace however like after this data replace however they want. So this is like a prerequisite for background replacement. Mm. Okay, we have not much time, right. so. Okay, yeah, uh, I wanted to note, Jan Ivar, that uh, like Riju said, this is kind of oriented towards the WebRTC case, 
uh, there was another API that we talked about, I think, in media working group, right, Ruju, that was more web codex like. That yes, was the yes. general one. So there, there, there are some thoughts on what you described, Yanniver, but it's kind of a different use case. Yes, Yanniver maybe got confused with another thing. I'm extending web codex for processing okay. that one. So, so that's yeah. that's where your uh, what you said was correct. Dom. Yeah, I mean, uh, just maybe to express what I heard from Yaniva, the, the concern is not about the value of doing background uh, segmentation. It, it is about having media processing primitives specific to uh, the camera source. Um, and I understand where this is coming from. This is because the driver itself is providing uh, that performance boost. But, but I think that's where the architectural tension is, uh, whether we provide generic media processing, of which this would be one of the feature, or whether we optimize for the specific case of hardware-based uh, sources, which may have additional uh, accelerated processing uh, support. Yes, uh, I get it. But uh, yeah, again, uh, sometimes when you want 2x or 3x performance improvement and way to low power, uh, that was my main objective. So I can share some performance charts uh, in a few weeks, I'll put it in the explainer. Right. Yeah. I, I just uh, you, you, your question, I think, was whether there was interest, right? So I just want to clarify that yeah. I don't yeah. think I have strong interest at the moment. Uh, but it's, it, I think we have given some feedback uh, on API ship. Should this be interesting? And this might also be a market question, right? I, like for, mm. for a while, gaze detection was new and foreign, and now gaze detection seemed to be more generally accepted so i think there's a there might be something here if we can yeah say that this there, there's a market demand for yeah. and this makes sense enough definitely to help Thank enough you. websites get to a similar performance for sure. a common use use feature definitely i mean we have to gauge the market demand and yeah but uh, right now I, I, i'm more hesitant than enthusiastic mm. but uh, mm. that might change Sure. Okay, so I think we've reached the end of the meeting. Hopefully, uh, Dom, you've got everything for the summary. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, for presenting and uh, participating this month. And we'll be back in May. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. See you in May.